So um, I'm going to be talking about tracing for the most part and you know ensuring trace accuracy where we can and just kind of assessing how complete our picture of the um, kernel is via BTF. You know, it's kind of got to the point now where we're using BTF more and more in kernel observability and debugging. Um, so it's a good time to kind of assess how complete that picture of, of the, 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 the landscape is. Um, and we're going to be focusing, focusing on core kernel functions here. Um, to a certain extent, this presentation is kind of a little bit in the weeds. Um, the vast majority of kernel functions are represented in BTF and represented correctly. Um, but in tracing, it's really, really important to make sure that that representation is accurate um, where possible, because otherwise it can be kind of confusing for users. Um, so the specific motivation of this talk is, you know, I, I work with people who do debugging, kernel debugging and observability, and they often come to me and say, I wanted to trace this kernel function and it wasn't there. Um, that can happen quite frequently. And um, there's some long-standing issues that have come up in the community, like there's a, there's a GitHub issue there for BCC, um, where this um, particular form of optimization breaks K-probe observability. Um, and it's actually kind of surprising when you look at the numbers, as we will shortly, how frequently these kind of issues do occur. And I think probably the reason for that is um, when GCC optimizes stuff, it finds opportunities to get rid of redundancies. And sometimes code that maybe hasn't been looked at so closely has more of those redundancies. So, you know, a lot of the time the broken code is the very code you can't see. So, you know, this can kind of make a, what it, what's a bad problem a little bit worse. Um, so, you know, the idea here is really to talk about a potential solution to this. And it actually, um, I think Young Hong, um, he anticipated a way to solve this. Um, but what I'm going to suggest is maybe we can use some of the compile once run everywhere mechanisms as well and kind of mix them together and see if we can come up with a solution that is kind of intuitive for users um, and lets them see more of what's going on. So just to kind of do a little bit of a survey, um, on a recent BPF Next kernel, let's see how many kernel functions are represented in BPF and how many are missing. So when you do an object jump and you look at the um, symbol table, you get about 55,000, 56,000 functions. Um, and when we look at the BTF representation for that kernel, we get about 48,700. So we're missing about 7,000 functions. Um, so that's about one in eight kernel functions. Um, so let's just have a look at what those actual functions are. Um, so many of them are actually static functions which have multiple definitions. So this can happen in some of the different object files that comprise the kernel that might include, let's say, um, a header file with a static function that didn't actually get inlined. Um, so when you take them out of the mix, you get down to about 6,000 functions. Um, you know, in the case of these functions, they have identical functional signatures, so they aren't necessarily a BTF issue, but we probably do want to provide mechanisms to allow people to trace. Um, so in a case like this where it's the same function, you might want to have an attach all option, for example, rather than, you know, I'd say, I don't know, I haven't looked at the code in detail, but I suspect what happens today is you probably get the first function in KOL sims that you come across with that name. Um, maybe not, I'm not sure, I'd have to check, but, um, in a case like this, you don't want to miss events. That's the key thing. From a tracing perspective, you really want to see when things happen um, and, and be able to trace them. So, you know, that might be one potential solution in this case. Um, so the next kind of family of things that we that are missing are these um, um, functions which are uh, suffix with a dot code. Um, so you can see in K all sims when you look, a lot of functions are paired with a dot code version of, of the same function. So what are these? Um, so, and just to say, I'm not a compiler person, so if anything here looks wrong, please, you know, do interject, because the documentation on this stuff is kind of hard to find. I may have missed the point in, in some places, so if any of this is incorrect, um, do let me know. So, basically what happens with code functions, um, I'll give you an example, is um, if we have a kind of unlikely to run subset of a function, that gets punted off to a, a cold uh, function, and then we jump to that when that those unlikely to, to execute um, portions of code happen. So the idea is like if an allocation fails, that, that allocation failure code path gets moved to that co .cold. And the idea of that is it improves code locality. So everything you've got is kind of the golden path in your code, um, and that, that's, that can be helpful sometimes. Um, so when we take them out of the mix, we're down to about 3,000 functions. Now, in the case of these, you can ask, well, do we want observability in this case? And you could say maybe. Um, but we're kind of diverging a little bit from the code itself. So a lot of the time when people are debugging, they're, they've got the code open one window, they're, they're tracing in another window, and the relationship between the, the, the code and actually what you're tracing is, is kind of what you want to preserve where possible. Um, so you might want to trace this stuff, but in the majority of cases, I suspect you really care about the actual function signature itself and tracing that. Um, so the next subset that we come across are these parse 
dot n function, so like part dot zero, um, there's 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 suffix with that. So when you look at KO sims, you'll see those suffixes. Um, and sometimes that's that's they're very they're paired with a dot part variant like we saw last time. Sometimes we just have the dot part um, uh, part on its own. Um, so what are these? So the dot part stands for partially in line. So if we've got a big function, um, there might be a small subset of it um, that we can inline, but then there's another section of it that we can't inline. Um, so what happens is we inline the part that we can inline and then call out to the other part. So when you think about this from a tracing perspective, if you were to trace the dot part aspect of the function, it's not the same thing as tracing the function itself because that little small part which got inlined, we're missing that, all of that execution there. So in this case, I think we probably don't want to represent, we certainly don't want to represent the part part of the function as the actual function, and the function signature could, could diverge. It also probably is unlikely to be represented in dwarf. Um, so in this case, then, I don't think we really need to, to, to concern ourselves too much. So taking these out of the mix, we get down to just under 2,000 functions. Um, so the next case is the one I think that is probably most interesting from our perspective because this is kind of like a one-to-one -one replacement of the optimized function with the original function. Um, so there's a big kind of long mouthful of, of um, the description there. Um, you can take a look at that. But basically what happens here is sometimes we've got, um, a, like let's say, a pointer, um, and then we've maybe got a, a value that's accessible from that pointer that we're passing in in the function signature. So GCC notices this, and it dumps one of the values. And sometimes we can get constant replacements with constant values as well. So what we end up with is a fun function signature that looks quite different from the original. Um, so here's an example. Um, so we've got a function um, with a structure that we're calling with a pointer to the structure and the values from the structure as well. Um, and in this case, what happens is the pointer to the structure gets optimized out. Um, we pass in the first value, and then GCC notices the second value is a constant. So our actual fun function signature, um, what's in the registers, is going to be quite different to what we might expect. Um, so, so that's kind of important to know. Um, so when we look at the sort of top-level description of that function dwarf, we see what, the, what we might expect from looking at the code. So we see the parameters, we see the, the, the structure and the, and the, the value, the two values. Um, but if we actually look a little bit closer, we actually have a later um, sub-program tag which references the original one and actually has the correct information. And the reason for this, and I, I struggled to find this, I eventually discovered some, um, some comments in the source, is when we're generating the debug info, there's a number of passes that happen. So one of the passes happens after the optimizations have occurred. So we can actually grab some of that information from the kind of later reference um, description of that function. Um, so for one of these .isra functions, we can correlate that abstract description with the original, and we can note where um, arguments actually refer to registers, um, which would be which would mean they're kind of what we'd expect them to be. Um, and then you know we can look at cases where there's constants and, and the stuff that's been passed via the stack as well. So we can see all that stuff because Dwarf has this concept of locations, which we can grab information from. Um, so then the last kind of um, suffix case is these const prop functions. So this is constant propagation. So this will happen in cases like, let's say if I call a function um, with a pointer to a static variable. Um, if there's multiple cases of this, sometimes we get a different const prop version for each one of them. So obviously in the multiple case, this is problematic because we'd have to have multiple BTF representations for that same function. So um, that would be difficult, unless you were to do something with BTF, like have the full const prop name in, in the BTF representation, um, that would cause a problem. So, what, what about the instruct? Are you, are you proposing you can represent them? Yeah, yeah, well, actually, I'll, I'll get to that in a couple of slides, yeah, exactly. So, um, the, and the remaining pieces are things like um, assembly functions, declaration only stuff, which often points in at the assembly functions and things we probably don't really need to worry about too much. Um, uh, some stuff that's um, to do with some of the, some of the spectra fixes as well. Um, so the easier cases then. So the .cold and .part cases, um, you know, there's generally no dwarf information in those cases. They don't really correspond to anything in the source code. So from a debugging perspective, you're probably not going to be using them too much. Um, and the declaration only cases are explicitly skipped for in PLO for, for for generation and assembly only. We probably don't really care about it either. Um, duplicate set of functions, as I said, we might have some sort of um, way of supporting a multiple attach to, to all of them. So in case you know your tracer um, doesn't, you want to make sure your tracer doesn't miss any of those type of events. Um, 
And another possible option here, which um, uh, Nick Alcock was talking about on Monday, was to have to basically store in KOL Sims additional information about each of those various points. Um, so, for example, if they were compiled into the kernel, maybe what you know, if we could figure out what module they would have been in had it been a module, um, that could might maybe give some more clues to actually help differentiate things a little bit more. Um, so the harder cases are really the kind of is RA part and construct. Um, we can kind of get rid of the dot part case because you know that's the partial inlining situation. And from a tracing clarity perspective, if we're going to miss the actual function execution, it doesn't really help us. Um, you know, we're just getting to see the partially inlined code path, whereas we're not actually seeing every instance where that function executed. Um, so for the constant propagation case, um, it is possible to handle that one and um, but if we have multiple um, instances with different constant propagations it might be a little bit difficult to represent that in BTF somehow um, so from my perspective um, as Jesper was saying I mean the, the is RA case is probably the one to look at um, so if we want to represent optimizations in BTF um, we have a couple of questions we probably want to answer and, and you know hopefully you folks might have some feedback on this so one question would be, should the BTF actually reflect the optimizations or the original function signature? Or should we have maybe multiple representations, one of the original function signature, one of the optimized version? Um, and if we didn't want to represent all this stuff with the, with the fun function prototype, so the BTF represents the, the function prototype and it tells you all the types in that function prototype. So if we weren't going to use that to represent, you know, maybe there would be some other way we could annotate that function prototype. And, and you know how would, how would that representation work? Um, so compile once run everywhere. I mean, we've had this for types, and it's brilliant. Makes life so much easier. It would be nice if we had something similar for functions, because if you can imagine, you know, the whole thing about types is you jump from one kernel to the other. The types can have different offsets, but as a consequence of core, we don't have to deal with any of that pain. So this is sort of a similar case. You know, you jump from one kernel to the next. Suddenly, your function got optimized out due to some small change in the code, which isn't really that, or even just a compiler upgrade. And then suddenly your function disappears and it's not traceable anymore. Um, so ideally, we kind of want to insulate users from that kind of pain um, in the, if we're taking the kind of core philosophy. Um, so one thing I would maybe suggest would be we retain the non-optimized function signature um, for, from Dwarf. So basically, that's kind of cleaving close to what the code has while providing additional annotations that might allow a tracing program to get the actual ar accurate argument data where possible. Um, and then as a follow-on to that, libbpf might be able to use these annotations to hide those, off well, hide is probably the wrong word, we probably want to insulate users from these optimizations, but we probably don't want to hide it completely, because it would, in some cases, users might want to know that, that these optimizations are in place. Um, so yeah, can we use core mechanisms in, in this case to actually insulate users from the fact that everything isn't in the registries I might actually normally expect it to be due to these optimizations having occurred? So, um, and, and this is kind of coming back to Young Hong had a suggestion on that original um, uh, discussion thread about BCC, where we have declaration tags that can reference a specific argument in a function, function signature. So the BTF references the function prototype, and it can tell us something about a particular argument in, in that function prototype. So maybe, um, and you can see in GDB we have something like this. So when you when you when you open up a function like this in GDB, you might you know, if you're tracing it um, and you hit the breakpoint, it'll tell you that an argument was optimized out or whatever. Um, so having conventions around some of these tag names, which tell us if an argument is optimized out or is a constant, might be possible. And then perhaps we could use some of that information to populate relocations, which might make the user see something that looks a little bit more like they might originally expect to see. Now, the problem with this is, you know, it's like, how far do you go? You don't want to lie completely. I mean, if a function has optimized out, a, a, a pointer, for example, you know, you don't want to try and fake up something to, to, to represent that. So, you know, I think the, the devil's in the details here, so we probably do need to figure out. I mean, one kind of maybe one example we can draw on is um, the BPF exception handling for BPF tracing programs. So if you're not familiar for F entry and F mod return and, and all those type of functions, um, when you actually dereference a pointer and you hit a null, um, rather than actually um, the verifier jumping the program out, it, at runtime the exception handler will run and it will zero out the target value. So you know maybe zeroing out is good, but then it's also ambiguous because if you're tracing, you want to know what's going on. So you don't want people to think 
incorrectly that are, they've been passed a null argument because if it's, you know, a lot of the time you try and track down a bug and you think, oh, well, there's my problem, it's a null argument. Um, so I think we have a little bit of a balancing act here. We want to make users' life easier, but at the same time, we don't want to lie either. We want to try and make sure that there's some sort of transparent mechanism um, that people can actually kind of query a little bit if they have to. Um, so I kind of came up with the proof of concept, which is quite simple. It takes the kind of simplistic approach of saying, if we have this extra information in Dwarf that tells us a function's been optimized out and tells us which arguments are missing, um, if an argument isn't a register, it doesn't correspond to a register, then we kind of skip it. So this will give you a more accurate um, representation in BTF, but the, the downside is that then they diverges from what the original source code is, and it's not very compiled once run everywhere because it's going to look different on a, on a curly with optimized functions. Um, so this is just skipping at the moment, but we could, you know, I think the way we probably want to go is a sort of some sort of annotation procedure where we actually use um, something like the tagging process to, to actually annotate, and then we can use relocations to help. Another thing that you could do as well is um, maintain multiple representations. So we have a representation in BTF of the name of the function with that optimized suffix. So people can attach to that if they want, but if they have a, a function that's, uh, if they have a BPF program that's attaching to, you know, whatever the name is without the suffix, then maybe we try to um, insulate them a little bit from some of these implementation details where possible. So, for example, um, let's see here. Um, so, yeah, so the proof of concept will do things like it will notice. In this case, this is a const prop function. In this case, it was passed a static um, variable uh, pointer to uh, instead of that in, in that pause uh, for that final argument um, and we can see that from the location um, the proof of concept spots this and it notes that it isn't a register so the actual final function signature of btf won't have that final argument to represent that but like i said we want to do something probably a little bit more sophisticated um, so we also see cases where functions that don't have these suffixes aren't perhaps um, doing what we might expect in terms of argument passing. Um, one example is this one where we're passing a large structure on, 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 and in this case it happens via the stack. Um, so maybe some of these mechanisms could be used for those cases too. I saw a couple of other cases where functions with very long sets of arguments didn't use registers for every argument you might expect. So I think like the fourth argument in, suddenly we ended we wound up on the stack and I don't think it was even a structure. So you know this approach may help tracing accuracy for cases that don't relate to optimizations, or at least very clear, clearly visible optimizations with those suffixes as well. So it feels like something that we need to figure out um, to, to maintain trace accuracy. But like I say, we need to figure out some of the principles. I think the key principle we really want to figure out is what we want to represent at the top level of BTF. Um, do we want to represent something that more cleaves closely to what the, the function um, definition is in the code? Or do we want to kind of reflect what's happening um, in terms of optimizations? And I think, I think if we can, the sort of compile once run everywhere answer to that would be, you want to represent maybe more closely what the code is, and then you know have all these annotations which help us figure out, okay, well actually, what are these arguments in practice? What's in the registers and so forth? So to actually fix this, like I was saying, you know, can we admit? emit relocations for some of these tagged arguments and and you know we have this pt reg is parm you know one two three four core um, um can, and can, is there some way we could use those um and hack it up to to to, to point at the right things i probably give it a different name so that users know that they're using it fully in the knowledge that you know we're, ga we're gathering this information potentially to do with optimizations and we may not actually what we may we see may not be reflective in the actual register values at that particular time um, the difficulty with this is, though, of course, not in every case. You don't know in every case what you're attaching to, so it would need some of this um, relocation stuff would have to be probably attached time as well. Um, and it would obviously because it's we're talking about BPF tracing programs, it would probably be F entry and F mod return and all those type of functions we'd be dealing with. Um, so the conclusion really is, you know, handling optimizations is hard. I mean, the poster child for this is this this copy query item function, which. Okay, let's see if we can figure this out. So it was partially inlined. The partial inline part um, did constant propagation, and GCC also found that there was very you know, there's values there that could, could be optimized out as well. So you can have all of these things at once. Um, I think the key thing we really want to do in any solution to come up with is ensure tracing semantics makes sense. Um, I'd rather we erred on the side of not representing something at all than representing something that could be misinterpreted um, from a tracing perspective. Um, 
So I think separating the function signature, which is more stable from any optimizations that might occur under the hood, is the most compiled one to run everywhere, like behavior. And I think that would be a nice thing to shoot for if it's possible. Um, and that late dwarf debug info, we have a couple of different cycles of generating that debug info, as I said. That gives us a mechanism, at least, to try and spot some of these optimizations and maybe fix things up. Um, and the BTF declaration tags, which you have, it seems like a really good mechanism to allow us to annotate some of these function prototypes. But how we put, how we put all those pieces together, I think that's ultimately the challenge here. So I'd be interested to hear any perspectives on, you know, do folks think this is worth solving? I mean, like I say, I think this is worth solving, you know, simply for the fact that, you know, the same guy comes to me every year and he goes, like, it's happened again. The function's gone. I really need to trace this one. The code's a mess. Um, and I want to have a good answer for him. Uh, and, you know, it just like I say, it's this optimization seems to happen precisely at the points where the code is complex and messy and hacky. So they're the exact places you want to have observability. So I think it would be nice to have a solution here. And I think the actual raw numbers of, like, I think it's like 800 functions have this SRA um, suffix don't really reflect the pain that these functions can cause. So I think having tracing here would be really valuable. So I think, I think I'm done. So if anyone has questions, comments, or suggestions, I would be very glad to hear them. And just to say, that's the, that's the, um, the summary of the problem. So this problem came up a couple of years ago. This has been a long-standing issue. And we actually have some of the mechanisms now, I think, of it, um, available to us to solve it. And that's just um, on my GitHub there. That's just the proof of concept, which actually spots the optimized parameters. Doesn't do anything fancy with them yet. It basically just leaves them out. So you know, that's just to say we can do we can do something here. I think what the something is is the key question. I do think one thing that will be valuable is from a user experience perspective is that if there is a function that is inline, yeah, uh, I would rather have it error out uh, and not try to attach to the non-inline version and not get any data out of it because. It was not inline in the previous version of the kernel. Has been inline now, and suddenly I stopped getting data in my application because that that function was inline. So that would be that would be good to have. So if you can prove, if we can prune out those and not allow attachment in the very basic case, yeah, that would be that would be good. But if we can go and figure out where it's been inline and attached to that inline symbol instead, and figure out the right signature, it could be valuable, but it may give you extra data which you don't want. There, right? Yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe yeah. Certain, so let's say I'm con counting M map. M map invocations in, in, in a particular place called purple red M map. Yeah. Right? And this symbol gets inlined in the next kernel and I'm now being inlined in a different place. It may not give me the right data. So I probably want to look more carefully there on where this is actually being inlined. But yeah, I think I would like to have an error when this happens. I want to know when this is breaking my production in this case. Yeah, sure. To that point, I think there's a distinction between the type information of the kernel and the final mapping between types and code. And so Dwarf exposes this clearly yeah. as a type section and application section. And trying to encode all the location information into the BTF section feels like exploring the BTF section with information that is vastly different in type. And further, also the mapping between um, the optimized versions and the original code they're not they're not just renamings as you discovered and so dwarf expresses them as a virtual machine and i don't know we have a virtual machine too so maybe we could express them that way too right and have like little snippets of bpf that transform the versions and maybe include them in a new section or something um kind of crazy thoughts out there but um my i guess my point is it's not type information anymore this is about mapping um, source code types to optimized types, and that mapping is not linear. Yeah. And storing it with the type information of the final kernel feels a little bit like a hack. Yeah, I mean, I think I should qualify what I said in that I wouldn't, I mean, it's not a good idea to do this where there's multiple cases where, so if you have different optimizations and that those optimizations work differently. In a case like that, you don't want to store things because it's just it's too messy. I mean, but in a lot of cases, we actually like the SRA case. It's like a one-to-one -one replacement. So I think in a situation like that, it's probably worth doing. Um, so the other cases like constant propagation. You know, if you so imagine you have the same function that's been called with different static variables, you get a different constant prop version for each one of those. And in a situation like that, I think you just want to skip it because it just makes life too too complicated. Like you say, you've got different basically you've got different behavior, different call sites. And starting to represent call sites in BTF is not the way we want to go. Right, but that's crazy. In that case, with constant propagation, I would rather have the attach all semantic, right? Like where 
because it has not been in line. It has been optimized with like two different uh, that with the constant propagation stuff. Mm -hmm. I want to be in. I want my tracing program to be invoked on all these uh, all, all these locations with this one. Yeah, I mean, I think. Oh, but, like, the other is important to say, like, I want to attach to address and that's like that's this graphics. Then you add like, yeah. and that's. Yeah. If you only care about like event of invoking this function and not about arguments, right? Most of the complexity is about arguments. And like, I don't think you can automatically solve those problems. And like, because of that, I would like you to yeah, not even try because like it's it's much more problematic. I think that's the big difference between GCC and the GPL approaches, for example. GCC tries to guess what user wanted. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, and quite often, it guesses wrong, and like people are actually pissed off, and that's why they dislike GCC very often. So like instead of trying to do something sensible in some cases and like suddenly breaking out, it's just like better just to say like okay, you are advanced user, you want to like attach to this optimized transform function, you just need to know that you are attaching to it. Yeah, you have to do it. Two in itself just might might make it a little bit easier to express. It. Like you know, I don't care about different variants. Like if I should have everything with this practice, right? And that's what the UPL can also provide, right? Like when you have K probe, you can say I want K probe A B C star, right? And it's fine. Like adjusting the PT racks five core to do some relocations, which will first work only for the kernel, while PT racks is also used for users, user probes, right? It's just crazy, to be honest. Like too much complexity, which will solve like I don't know, partial, partial. So I do want the the people to add out when the function is in line. If, if there is in line, because we see this quite often. Oh, I am not getting any data out of this event. What happened there? And you're like, okay, maybe this is called in line. That's the So. <laughs> My two sons is uh, improving all to the and make it understand all of this additional work that explains all the optimization. And I don't think it's that necessary in every step. But what we do with this information is questionable. I think if I understood your proposal to make uh, to make it more smart and I think we probably should start towards the safer route, meaning like if in this like, work operation, you see that, oh, the function is actually there, but it was in line in a few places. It's probably, instead of trying to do it too smart, it's better to remove it from the tier. So, so it solves a uh, use case, so don't, when we attach it, waste well, So we don't attach it at all. But so then, the problem in the other cases where the function uh, is to a so we need to check whether, so that, so that information in the tier for the function matches to scale six. Because the candy case that function, for example, compiler decided to do some optimizations but without any suffix, and the function name stayed the same. So we would see in PTF that this three arguments, but in the actual table scene, the name stayed the same without any suffix, but it's doing something else, potentially possible, especially it's not only GCC that as this client does things completely differently using different suffixes and everything. And my client is like use it at all. Like I've seen cases where client instead of like in a C code you will have six arguments and then generated code will be four. Yeah. Like a few arguments just completely gone, but then the function stayed the same and it's, it's a symbol. Yeah. So and what will have this, so we probably want to remove all of the things from the GM. And and like to add to what KT, right, like you said, like I want to know what the function is like. I think like my instinct is this, right? This is more like the problem of our good libraries, where you can, as a user, you want to check, like, do we have inline instances of this function, right? And like, it's it's doable right now because Borf and Co is all that. It's just like, hard and painful because Borf is complicated format, right? So instead of complicating BTR format to make it hard to work with, like, better to like invest in like some common library that like you won't have like 10 copies of it, right? It's just, as a community, let's come up with like a good library for tracing it. And I don't think that's the VPF actually. So more like that VPF slash tracing companion library we have, right? Like we have Blaze Sim that like is, is supposed to solve like symbolization, so maybe like some combination of that. But like solve this well, partially solve this problem by giving users tools to easily query this, right? And then this library can grow more complicated by handling if we have work, we use work. We have VTF and VTF has this information, you might use VTF. If not, I'll give up and like give some 
Okay, I, I guess I was trying to say that the source of the generation of BTS. Is <laughs> no, I, I agree with that. It's saying that we need to generate like information for the ISRA variants and all the stuff where it matters, right? And like if if we know error prone use case, it will be one more than that. Sure. But but that's that's about like like authority data, that type data. We should try to strive to make it correct, right? But like, the bigger issue is like, oh I don't automatically adjust to like differently optimized variants of funds. I think you can that's fact. How is it just maybe you have to separate to your pair of so I think what I'm hearing is if we see a function without a suffix name and we find optimizations in it. We want to drop it from BTF because it's confusing. If we ha we might want to add the BTF representations of the suffix names as well, so people can actually trace them if they want to. Um, but we don't want to confuse people by trying to do too much for them um, by trying to map between the original function and the suffix name. Is that an accurate representation? But we also need to decide like what are we making? Yeah, like, what we make BTF right? Like, is this like and more simpler replacement of the form. I, I don't think we should like target entirely like com you know replacement of the form as, as we can, right? So in this case, instead of re like, removing it, it's also bad, right? Because like, you not just dump batteries in this internal. Maybe like, marking it with some bit that like oh dangerous whatever optimized yeah. it might be a little bit mm -hmm. better. But I yeah. think so we should keep all that in form as much as possible. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Is this summer magic?